are glad to have you here worshiping with us this morning. We've been talking this year about being on mission with Jesus, and we know that that is a lifelong quest, and there's always more ways to be doing that. And so we continue to look into the scripture and find examples there and how that happened for different people. Today, I just want to directly invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 3. This is immediately after the, the, uh, the uh, events of the first two chapters of Acts when, when Jesus, who had risen from the dead, had gone back into heaven. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and then it enters into Acts chapter 3, and here Peter and John are, and they're going to the temple. Would you uh, follow along with me as we read this scripture this morning? Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so that he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, Look at us! The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold from you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and to John. Folks, this is a normal day. I don't know, did you notice that this was a three o'clock service? How many of you would show up if I would say today, this next week we're going to have service at three o'clock in the afternoon? No committals, so maybe we'll wait till next week to try that one, okay? So, but this was a daily ritual of the Jewish religion. They would have a morning sacrifice and an afternoon sacrifice. And so here Peter and John were, and they were headed up to this temple to join in with the daily sacrifice and prayer rituals that happened every day and the worship that happened. Ordinary day. There's two groups of people. There's the people who are going to worship, who, who, who are flowing in. There's the lame man who sits by the gate of the temple. He's at the gate, he's on the outside because the lames and the cripples were not allowed to enter into the temple of God in the Jewish religion. Only what was holy and pure and perfect could get inside there. So here's the lame man. He's carried there by some people. Are they his friends? Does he have to pay them from the proceeds of what he gets? The Bible doesn't go into those kinds of details. But there he is, and he's there. He regularly is there begging for money so that he would have a form of sustenance for himself. The other group of people are the worshipers. They're people that are doing their daily uh, worship practice. When you go to worship at the temple, you get to interact with other people. It's the social thing to do as well. And so there they are. And you know what? I'm thinking this morning that the temple gate's a pretty good place to beg, right? Because if I'm feeling that when I get in to worship God and he might have a frown on his face because of my behavior that week, maybe he'll feel a little bit better to me if I just am a little bit more generous in giving alms to this poor man that's sitting at the temple gate, right? Or after I come out from the temple and I realize that, that, uh, that the God's heart is also for the poor, maybe I'll be generous on that end as well. So this man has a good thing going here. And so here come Peter and John entering into this dynamic. There are people that are worshiping. There are people, you know what? I think they've passed by this man many times before. 
In fact, you think Jesus ever worshipped at the, at the temple? It's possible that Jesus walked past this man many times before. And it was just an ordinary day. But here at this moment, here at this time, Peter and John are going up to worship. Now let's just pause and think about this a little bit. Had Jesus already died? Yes. Had he risen again? Yes. Did they understand that now Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for sin? Yes. Did they understand that this was changing how they worshipped as Jewish people? Yes, they did. But yet they still entered in, right? So even though they were saying, we're now Jesus Christ followers, we recognize Jesus as the Messiah, the sent one from God, even so, they're still fellowshipping because this is the Jewish way of approaching God. They're interacting in with that, but when the priest is saying the prayers that's saying, come, Father God, send the Messiah, Peter and John are praying, come into each person's life, right? Jesus, who's already come, come individually, reveal yourself, because so much of the Jewish nation is rejecting who you are, come and receive him. It even happens that way today. Did you know that there are Jesus worshipers in Islamic mosques to today? In fact, there's reports of whole mosques of people that are worshiping Jesus as a savior from their sins. They're recognizing that this God of Abraham is fulfilled in Jesus, but they're still worshiping because it's part of the Muslim religion. It's part of their culture, their way of life. A number of years ago, I was talking to a, to a uh, Muslim cleric with a bunch of other people in, uh, in uh, Djibouti, and he said, he said, the problem with you Christians is you keep Jesus in prison in your churches. Jesus for the whole world, right? He transcends culture, right? Everybody who comes into reconciled relationship with Jesus spends eternity with him. And it doesn't have to be associated with a lot of other, or, or, or Jesus enters into every culture. It doesn't matter what your culture comes from. As he enters into that, he begins to transform it. He begins to change it. He starts from where you are and takes you in, brings you into a fellowship of faith that is at home in its culture, even while we also say that we're on this journey that has a loyalty in heaven that supersedes our loyalty. Isn't that an amazingly profound, seemingly almost contradiction to hold that all together? I think that's why we call it a Christian faith, right? Instead of a Christian know, instead of a Christian understand, Instead of a Christian do, it's a Christ-like walk of faith. And we're saying this year that we're asking his spirit presence for more and more that we're on mission with Jesus. That we're living this out. We're living it out by faith. We're walking it out. We're stepping into it more and more. We're doing this, not because we understand it all. Not because we can give you the formulas for it, but because the presence of Jesus is alive and well. And he wants to be connecting into your life and taking you on the next step of that journey with him. So here Peter and John are, Christ followers, delightfully enthused that the Holy Spirit's living within them, attuned in to what the Spirit of God is doing in the world. These are marks of disciples, by the way, marks of people that are on mission with Jesus. And so they're going up to the temple Let's go in through the beautiful gate, and there's this man. Oh, yeah, there's that man again. He's a lame man. His job is to ask for money. And that day, Peter doesn't have any money. It's like, I can't meet the expectations. I can't do what I should be doing. I can't fit in. And so, he's, so, <sighs> did you ever feel that way? that God takes away your normal way of responding to situations because he wants to do something new in your life? Do you know what I mean? He presses you into the wall because he wants to know that you know that he is the only resource that will be sufficient in this moment, that he's the only one that will carry you through. 
where it's not so much an option. I mean, it's like, do you ever, I mean, when the Holy Spirit begins to work, there's like this stirring. Way back in Genesis, it describes it where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. He begins to create the world. Well, when he begins to create a new work in you, the same thing starts to happen. There's this hovering presence. There's this awareness that the Spirit of God is about to work, and he's asking you to tune into it so that you can be cooperating with it. Well, it's easy to mistake that. If Peter had had a 10 and a 20 in his pocket, he might have mistaken what the Holy Spirit wanted to do was to be give both of those bills and not choose which one today, right? But all those options were gone. And so he says, look at me. Look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, when you're the one that needs to receive, sometimes it's kind of embarrassing, right? It's hard to believe that I'm equal to the person that's giving in those moments. Sometimes when we're the ones that giving, it's hard for us to believe that as well. Human confession here. But to understand that the Spirit of God, that the image of God, that is the image of God that's planted within us is equal because we're all made in His image. And so whether you're the one that's giving or the one that's receiving, there's a God-glorifying image that's within you that wants to be expressed. That wants to be expressed in who you are. And if you're trying to always be on the giving end and never on the receiving end, my guess is that your giving is full of condescension and you're not giving out, you're giving down, which does not represent the image of God, which is showing disrespect to God and your fellow human because you're somehow treating them as less than you. And all of us stand in an equal place before God, e equal footing, equal need of his grace, equal... There's always something to give and always something to receive. And God asks us to be part of that whole equation, always ready to be letting the grace of God flow into our lives and to be flowing out of our lives as well. So Peter says, look at me. And the man looks. I'm thinking it's because of this. It's, it's okay this morning that I'm reading between the lines, right? Okay? So I'm thinking the man's thinking, you know, I've seen this before. When somebody wants to be really generous, they'll often call attention to it. Because they want other people to see how generous I am. Because if I'm really generous in what I'm giving, then you'll think that I'm somebody special. And I'm really not giving because of my concern for the person, my compassion for the person. I'm giving it so others take notice of me and so that it increases my reputation. You're pretty quiet. Okay, you're laughing. You're not asleep. We'll keep going. Jesus took upon himself no reputation and became the lowest of all people dying a death on a cross. And Peter and John's conviction was to be like Jesus. And so he wasn't doing this to be pursuing his own reputation. And we'll get to that in a minute. So first thing he does after he says, look at me, he dispels the man's image by saying, I don't have any money for you. Money I do not have. I have no silver or gold. I am not able to meet what you're expecting. But as he's saying, look at me, he's also saying to the man, raise your expectations. Don't just look, expecting for a condescending handout of a coin. But look up. Hmm, that sounds familiar, right? Look up, your redemption's drawing nigh. Look up, the fields are white, ready for harvest. Look up, 
Jesus is preparing a way for you, a place for you. Jesus is extending hope into your life to be responding to and to be calling you to rise up above the worry and care of your present situation and your circumstances. Look up. Change your expectation. The way the Spirit of God wants to minister into your life and heart today is different than what you've experienced before. Today's your day. Today's your day to cooperate with Jesus being glorified in your life. Now, the third thing Peter says is, <laughs> sorry, you're my notes. Go on to the third side there. Money I do not have, and the next one is in the name of Jesus Christ. So it's like this isn't, this isn't Peter and John company this morning, right? It's not like Peter and John are about to do this great thing for you. They're coming, they're ministering in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is saying he's about to do something in your life. He's calling you to be responding to it, and he's wanting you to know it's at his hand, it's at his way that he is communicating, that he's interacting in your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, Peter's saying this is not about my name. This is not about my energy and my strength and even what my plan or purpose was. This is about the fact that Jesus is entering into your life. You are about to have an encounter with Jesus. Do you want it or not? It doesn't really talk about that, but do you realize what this man had to give up? He was making a living off of begging. Next day, he'd have to find a job. He might have had a special place to sleep because of his physical deformity. The next day, he might not have been welcomed there anymore. Jesus was about to complicate his life <laughs> in a very God-glorifying way, right? But this man had problems in his feet. He couldn't walk. I don't, he, and so Peter says, in the name of Jesus, walk. What's Jesus saying to you today? What are you, if you lift your eyes and you say, I'm getting beyond my circumstances, I'm getting beyond what I see day to day, I'm getting beyond the difficulties, the stress points. I'm getting beyond, and Jesus wants to fill your life with hope and expectation. He wants to place a promise within you today, so lift your eyes. What's his word to you? What do you hear in your spirit? What do you hear is the spirit stirring and moving and saying into your heart, this is what I have for you. This is the unexpected turn that has you believing for more, that has you knowing that as a personal mission with Jesus, that how I want to use your life is more than what you ever expected it to be. It probably isn't anything that you saw for yourself, that you chose for yourself, but as you open your eyes, as you step into it, you begin to see that God's been preparing you for this purpose. You begin to put the threads together, you begin to see the steps, and you begin to see that there has been a guiding hand on your life. You feel alone, you feel like you've been deserted, you feel like all those things because you're looking at yourself and God's saying, Jesus saying this morning, lift your eyes, look above your circumstances. Look with expectation in the name of Jesus to what he's wanting to be pouring out into your life. You would have thought that everybody would have been happy, right? But not so fast. <laughs> I mean, let's just put it in this context, okay? Just bear with me a little bit here. I mean, it's like, here come 
Suppose Peter and John would have come in to church today and done a healing. It's like, I wouldn't have gotten to preach. Well, I hope I would have been excited. I'm sure I would have been. But the Jewish leaders were like, this messed up our service. All the attention's going somewhere else. This man got healed and that's not what was planned. They weren't participating in our sacrifice, in our plan, in our holy moment. See, the Spirit of God is doing a new thing. He had been working through the sacrificial system, and then he invites them to let that alone and to move on to the next thing. Do you know that whatever God has in your life, he's always preparing you for what the next thing is as well. And at some point, he's going to say, are you willing to let go of what you are in order to reach for who I'm calling you to become? That's a walk of faith. That's what it means. Will you let go in order to reach on for what I'm calling you to become? Because Jesus is calling you on to mission with him. And so the Jewish leaders, they, they, they become, this is, this is a problem. And so they haul Peter and John in before the council. And they put them like on trial. They have a hearing for them. What are we going to do with them? They didn't follow the prescribed rules of what you're supposed to do when you go to the Jewish temple and worship. But they had to admit something, and this is, go to Acts 4.13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. To this pastor, it means they didn't go to seminary. Okay? They recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's the simple question for today. Can that be our goal? Wouldn't that be a wonderful identity? What if it was not only an individual identity, but a church identity? If there was this ministry happening out in the world and people's lives were being changed and... and and people knew, oh yes, they're CCF again. They're that way. Because they walk with Jesus. Because they're on mission with Jesus. They don't do it because they're clever people. They don't do it because they know how to beat the system. They don't do it. They just do it because the power of Jesus shows up wherever they gather. And they know that they're not to possess it, but they're to share it to spread it out with others, that this Jesus came for the whole world and that they're not to hold him unto themselves. You see what it means? Transforming your life and using you to change the lives of people around you. On mission, with Jesus, because we've been with Jesus. Because we're taking on his character and nature. Because his heart is growing in our heart. Because his motivation is becoming our motivation. That we begin to do what Jesus did for the same reasons that Jesus did them. That's a disciple. That's what he calls us to become. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Jesus, this morning we again invite you into our midst and say, would we be known that we have been with you and that we're taking on your nature, that we're ready to respond to the move of your spirit whenever you show up. In Jesus' name, amen.